<laughs> okay, so it's, uh, well, okay, it's uh, not about cats either. There will be no cats harmed during this uh, colloquium, or graduate students either. Um, it's about a paper that Schrodinger wrote in 1939, and the title of the paper is The Proper Vibrations of the Expanding Universe, and this is uh, the reference. It was published in Physica. Uh, it's in English if you happen to read it. It's not very long. I'll, I'll show you some of the pages from it. And it's about particle creation in the early universe, and, or, or about particle creation in cosmology. And this will be a graph that will make sense to you at the end of this, by the end of this colloquium. Let me say a little bit about the life of Schrodinger. He was, uh, lived from 1887 to 1961. And he was born in Vienna, and he came of age sort of at the turn of the century in Vienna. And it was a, quite an exciting intellectual environment in Vienna at the time. So I think of people active in art and uh, music in Vienna at the turn of the century. Of course, Gustav Klimt, uh, Gustav Mahler. Uh, I wish it would be Gustav Schrodinger, but it's Erwin Schrodinger. So it really was an intellectually vibrant place. Philosophy, people talked about philosophy all the time, so not everything was useful. But, uh, you know, it was, it was a very vibrant place. And it was also at the time of sort of the peak of the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire. You know, it was the peak right before it collapsed. A um, little bit more about Schrodinger. It's uh, in the biography of Schrodinger. It says that, he grew up in a very wealthy household without any indication that he was not the center of the universe. Uh, he was quite spoiled when he was a child. Here's a picture of him when he was a schoolboy. And in um, 1920, he married uh, Anne Marie or Annie Bertel. And uh, th this is sort of uh, something I'll just dispense with at the beginning. It was uh, a very beautiful marriage. They were married their entire life. It was a very loving, supportive marriage. Schrodinger had three daughters. Uh, none of them were with his wife. He had a rather unusual living uh, arrangement with his wife, who also had an unusual living arrangement uh, involving other women and for his, uh, his wife, other men. Uh, so I'll just dispense with that and just I came across a quote by Max Born uh, talking about Schrodinger's private life. He said, his private life seemed strange to bourgeois people like ourselves, but all this does not matter. He was the most lovable person, independent, amusing, temperamental, kind, and generous, and he had a most perfect and efficient brain. So uh, let me just dispense with that. Um, he was a student at the University of Vienna, and uh, after graduation, took positions at Jena, Stuttgart, Breslau, and in 1921, he became a professor at the University of Zurich. And, uh, of course, it was there that he wrote his most famous paper, um, Quantization <clears throat> as an Eigenvalue Problem, when he was 39 years old in 1926. Uh, in 1927, shortly after writing this paper, he took his real first foreign trip to the U.S. He visited the U.S. Uh, he wrote that he found the noise and dirt of New York shattering. Chicago was worse. He feared bandits who spring with loaded guns from speeding autos. Obviously, he visited the University of Chicago. Uh, also in 1927, Schrodinger depart departed Zurich for Berlin, where he took the position vacated by Max Planck upon his retirement. Uh, in hindsight, it was not a great time to take a position in Germany. Uh, in 1933, the, uh, he won the Nobel Prize. That was great. But the Nazis came to power in 1933. And Schrodinger had written uh, newspaper articles and was very uh, vociferous and public about his opposition to the Nazis. So when the Nazis came to power, Schrodinger was marked as politically unreliable, which was not a healthy uh, statement by the Nazis. It meant your life was somewhat limited. So he departed Berlin for what he described as exile in Oxford. 
He wrote that he did not like the Anglo-Saxon style at Oxford, and Oxford did not care for his living arrangements in Oxford uh, because they were rather unusual. So he departed Oxford in 1936 to take a position in Austria, in Graz, in a miscalculation of the political situation that Schrodinger described as an unprecedented stupidity. Indeed, two, less than two years later was the Anschluss in Austria, the annexation of Austria by Germany. And in 26 August, Schrodinger was dismissed. In 14 September, Erwin and Annie left Graz for Rome with 10 marks in his pocket, three suitcases without the Nobel Prize. He was met in Rome by Enrico Fermi, and he uh, took asylum in the Vatican. And Oxford wasn't exactly right for his lifestyle, and the Vatican, I didn't see how that fit either. Uh, in the uh, University of Chicago archives, uh, Fermi was at the University of Chicago for the last 10 years or so of his life, uh, there's an interesting correspondence between Schrodinger and Fermi, and they did a calculation. Uh, Schrodinger wrote uh, Fermi in 1951, saying, Dear Fermi, I beg you to help me remove once and for all a remorse that I cannot help associating with my memory of you at our last meeting, namely that I still owe you 400 lira, from September 1938. And then they did a cal he did a calculation. He recalculated this sum to the date of 1951, and he thought something like 200 Swedish crowns would be a modest estimate for repayment, and if you agree, if you have an account in Stockholm, I'll just uh, put the money there. Fermi uh, wrote back and said, Dear Schrodinger, misspelling his name, uh, as to the old debt that you mentioned, I believe you were estimating the value too high, etc. Schrodinger, uh, uh, Fermi goes through his calculation. He gives him his uh, $20. That's what uh, Fermi comes up with. Uh, he gives him his uh, bank account information in Chicago and then says, uh, if there are any difficulties whatsoever, don't worry about it because it's not worth it. Schrodinger didn't agree with his calculation, but he did agree that he wouldn't pay Fermi back the money that he was loaned. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, there, there's some other correspondence between the two great uh, scientists of the 20th century that's been interesting. Um, so the, the Vatican wasn't a great place for Schrodinger. So in another stupidity, in 19, summer of 1939, with Germany and France about to go to war, where would be a safe haven for you? Belgium, of course. So he accepted a position in Gent, Belgium, and uh, another stupidity. And it was there that his interest turned to cosmology. In Belgium, he, he met several times a Big Bang cosmologist, cosmologist Georges Lemaitre, and uh, he had had previous correspondence, which also he had in Belgium, with Arthur Stanley Evanston, the, the British uh, physicist, astronomer, uh, cosmologist. And in July 1939, uh, just when he just arrived in Belgium, he wrote a paper on the nature of the nebular redshift. So on the, the uh, expansion of the universe was discovered in 1929 by Hubble, and astronomers at the time, they still do, refer to recessional velocities and redshifts of, uh, with equivalent velocities. And this was a paper by Schrodinger pointing out that it's not really the Doppler effect. It's a, gravit it's a uh, general relativistic effect that the particle loses energy, the photons lose energy as the universe expands. So this... Um, was, was uh, one contribution in 1939. It was in 1929, 10 years before, that Hubble had discovered the expansion of the universe. This is a, Hubble, a figure from Hubble's original discovery paper uh, published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science in 1929. Um, it's a rather unusual thing to see. There are no error bars. 
The units of velocity are wrong, so he loses a couple of points on that lab report. And um, he does what uh, students love to do in labs. Whatever the data looks like, you draw a straight line, and you can see that it goes through all the points. Well, it turns out he was right about uh, the linear relationship. So let me say a word about Hubble, since I can brag a little bit, because he was a student at the University of Chicago and a member of one of our athletic, many athletic powerhouse teams of the University of Chicago, the 1909 National Championship basketball team. Now, I know at here you've won many national championships in basketball at Texas. Well, have, no, no, I don't think so. Here is a uh, photograph of Hubble from his times at Chicago, basketball player. And uh, this, this is also sort of a curiosity I'll share with you. John Grunsfeld was an, astro was an astronaut for NASA, and he three times, uh, went three times on the space shuttle to repair the Hubble Space Telescope. He got his PhD from Chicago. The last time he went up, he called and said, uh, do you have anything that Hubble used while he was at the University of Chicago? So we dug out a basketball from 1909 that Hubble used. And you probably can't see it, but I don't want to brag about this. Chicago 18, Indiana 12 in basketball. They played defense in those days. Now, I know everybody here at Texas A&M is bored talking about basketball. This is a football place. So uh, while we're talking about the athletic prowess of the University of Chicago, uh, what is the record of Chicago and Texas A&M in football? Well, there isn't one. They've never actually played each other. But there are, they played some common um, opponents, like Notre Dame. The University of Chicago is undefeated, a 4-0 record against Notre Dame. Now, all of the victories were in the 19th century, but still, 4-0. Eh, Texas A&M, not so good. <laughs> or not as good. Now, I know, you know, who cares about Notre Dame? There's only one opponent that really matters. And again, <laughs> Chicago, 68 to nothing. Smacked. The Longhorns, uh, Texas, uh, maybe not so good. All right, that's enough about Chicago. Okay, um, so in the summer of, 19, in August of, 19, early August 1939, Schrodinger realized that maybe he shouldn't stay in Belgium. He really was on the run. If he was captured by the Nazis, it was likely he would be sent to a concentration camp. He was politically unreliable. Um, so he departed Schrodinger for, uh, he departed Belgium for Dublin. And it was in the process of sort of running for his life, a stateless person, that he wrote this paper, The Proper Vibrations of the Expanding Universe. Uh, again, this is the reference to it. It was, it was received 21 August 1939. Published in October 1939, of course, in September 1939 was the beginning of the Second World War. There's no author affiliation listed for this paper. He didn't really have an institution. He was on the run when it was submitted. And it's only been cited 210 times, at least according to Google Scholar. Uh, but it has an interesting citation history. It was sort of ignored by Schrodinger also until um, maybe the late 60s, early 70s, there was a burst of interest. And the interest has only grown with time. And I don't know of any 80-year-old uh, paper that uh, would have a citation history like this. OK, so let's dig into this paper a little bit. Uh, you, I, I know in the back of the room you probably can't read this, so I will read it to you. The first thing I want to read is uh, Schrodinger's statement that the decomposition of an arbitrary wave function into proper vibrations is rigorous. What does that mean? 
Well, it means even in an expanding universe, a particle's wave function can be decomposed into positive and negative frequency modes, the usual thing you do in, um, in quantum mechanics. Uh, write the wave function as a function of time as positive and negative frequency modes. And in the um, field theory version, the particle occupation number is proportional to the absolute value squared of this coefficient beta, the Bogliubov coefficient. Schrodinger goes on to say these two proper vibrations cannot be rigorously separated in the expanding universe. That means to say that if in a certain moment only one of them is present, then the other one can turn up in the course of time. This means that if you start with a pure incoming or outgoing waves, they will become mixed in the course of time due to the expansion of the universe. Generally speaking, this is a phenomenon of outstanding importance. He never worked on this again, so I, I don't understand. I think he thought it was outstanding importance. With particles, it would mean production or annihilation of matter merely by the expansion. Uh, so, the, he says, the expansion of the universe creates particles from nothing. Uh, then he says, alarmed by these prospects, I've investigated the question in more detail. So my reading of this, this alarms me. I guess I'll ask the editorial decision uh, question of why. Uh, so I wrote a paper. Then uh, he goes. He goes on and does some calculations and uh, winding down to the conclusion, he writes, there will, there will thus be a mutual adulteration of positive and negative frequency terms in the course of time, giving rise to what in the introduction I call the alarming phenomenon. Schrodinger's two favorite phrases in this paper, alarming phenomenon and Mutual adulteration. He, he uses this every chance he can. So what Schrodinger was alarmed by is the creation of a single particle, particle pair, I should say, today, per Hubble time, per Hubble volume with a Hubble energy. Hubble time is about 10 billion years. A Hubble volume is about 10 to the 57 cubic kilometers. A Hubble energy is 10 to the minus 33 electron volts. So imagine how alarming it is to imagine somewhere in the universe, in the next 10 billion years, a particle will appear with energy 10 to the minus 33. Don't rush for the exits. Who's alarmed by this? People are scared by this? Yeah, there's someone alarmed by this. So of the circumstances faced by Schrodinger in 1939 in his life, why did this alarm him? And I think there's a, if I can make a social comment for a reason, uh, for a moment, there's something we can glean from this. Uh, so Schrodinger was started out in Graz on this journey. And there was another cosmologist in Graz, Johannes Kepler. And uh, he was tied up in the Thirty Years' War during his lifetime. And people asked him, how can you do astronomy with the world collapsing around you? And he said something I think is very beautiful. He said, when the storm rages and the state is threatened by shipwreck, we can do nothing more noble than to lower the anchor of our peaceful studies into the ground of eternity. So um, Kepler, the Thirty Years' War, was just absolutely brutal and inhumanity that we can hardly imagine today. Uh, Schrodinger's alarming time, the same thing we might say. You know, we live in alarming times now, and there's nothing more noble we can do than to lower the anchor of our peaceful studies in the ground of eternity. That's something for the graduate students. Okay, so um, I 
describe to you what Schrodinger's alarming phenomena was, at least in general terms, uh, then I'd like to turn to three questions. One, why was Schrodinger al alarmed? And then how to understand this mutual adulteration, the particle creation, just by the expansion of the universe. And finally, why is it important? Why 80 years later am I talking about it? Why do people care about it now? Why was Schrodinger alarmed? <clears throat> well, the appearance of particles from the vacuum, just popping out of the vacuum, just appearing, sounds a bit crazy. Uh, actually, there were technical issues with the calculations that Schrodinger did. Uh, he just did a quantum mechanical calculation to actually do the uh, calculation properly requires quantum field theory. Um, Schrodinger didn't state this, but now we understand that one only creates particles with mass less than the expansion rate, and today this is 10 to the minus 33 electron volts is the Hubble constant, maybe not in the units that uh, Nick is used to, but that's H naught today. And uh, again, it wasn't stated by Schrodinger, but one only creates particles if uh, violate some invariance, vial conformal invariance, I'll go into that a little bit. Uh, and so you would not create photons in the expansion of the universe because they couple to gravity in a, in a conformal way. Uh, and Schrodinger talked about creating photons in the expansion of the universe. So if Schrodinger had known this, would he still have been alarmed? Well, probably, I think. Schrodinger looked for and found a cosmological solution without mutual adulteration. Uh, it's not a very physical solution. He should have stood on his head to pr try to prevent this from happening. He thought it was a bug. Uh, perhaps he thought it was a conceptual challenge to quantum mechanics or general relativity. Uh, also, there would be an infinite particle creation in the standard Big Bang at time equal to zero. Maybe that alarmed him. Uh, but my takeaway from this is sometimes one should just follow the equations. The, I always find the equations are a lot smarter than I am. Believe in what you're doing and follow them through. And things that you believe might be bugs sometimes turn out to be, uh, to be features. Well, there was a lull in the 40s and 50s in interest in this. Then in the 60s, going into the 70s, there was a renewal of interest. I think it was mostly regarded uh, by people as a curiosity. In the U.S., it, uh, there was uh, several people worked on it, including Steve Fulling. And I remember when I was a, Steve probably doesn't remember this, when I was a graduate student in Austin in late in 77, 78, you gave a talk in the relativity group at Austin about particle creation. And I remember thinking, this is nuts. It's got to be crazy. Uh, there was also work in the Soviet Union and some work in the UK, but it was not really in the main line of research, either in general relativity um, uh, certainly not particle physics or in cosmology. The really the thing that rekindled this interest was an application of Schrodinger's alarming phenomenon that was uh, realized in the 1980s and that was uh, based upon the idea of inflation. And talking about particle creation in inflation is something I'll go into a little bit of a description of. Uh, done by these people led to a renewal of the idea of particle creation in the expanding universe. So there's uh, all the technical details basically have been worked out, most of them, and uh, there's even a book, Quantum Fields in Curved Space, where I learned much of uh, this information, and uh, by Burrell and Davies, I think it was oh, published in 1982. So, um, how do we understand mutual adulteration of the particle creation? Um, we understand in field theory that there is a quantum vacuum, and because of the uncertainty principle of quantum mechanics, particles and antiparticles are virtual particles are coming in and out of the vacuum at every point in space at all times. So if you would look at the quantum vacuum on submicroscopic scales, you would see <coughs> it's full of particle and antiparticle pairs. 
Now, the uh, realization that's important here is that this is for normal well, Minkowski space, just normal space, but external fields can disturb the quantum vacuum. And there's a common thread in this that ties together several seemingly different applications. One is that a changing electric field can lead to particle creation. This was first pointed out by Heisenberg and Euler in 35, Weisskopf in 36, and finally put in the complete form that we understand it today by Julian Schwinger in 1951. And the way to think about this, in the absence of an uh, electric field, particles and antiparticles, uh, virtual particles and antiparticles are coming in and out of the vacuum. But imagine if there's an electric field. Then as the particles come, uh, in the vac come out of the vacuum, the uh, electron would be accelerated by the electric field in one direction, and the positron would be accelerated in the other direction. And uh, if you go through the calculations, you realize that you can rip the particles out of the vacuum and have particle creation if the energy gained by acceleration from the electric field over a Compton wavelength of the electron exceeds the particle's rest mass. So if you have a strong enough electric field, the electron and positron comes out in the vacuum, they're pulled apart by the electric field, and if they're accelerated to relativistic speeds, they can come out of the vacuum. This is also the way that, as a field theorist, I understand Hawking radiation, uh, that a gra tidal gravitational field can also lead to particle creation. And in a tidal gravitational field, that you can have an acceleration difference between the, electron, between the positron and the electron, and again, Particle creation, if the energy gained an acceleration from a gravitational field over a Compton wavelength, exceeds the particle's rest mass. So in the same spirit, we can imagine an expanding universe leading to particle creation. Particles can come out of the vacuum in the expanding universe and sort of get caught in the expansion of space. And you can have particle creation, again, if the energy gained in expansion over a Compton wavelength exceeds the particle rest mass. And this is the way that I uh, visualize Schrodinger's alarming phenomenon. So that's the rough idea, sort of the physical idea. And uh, since I'm a theorist, I'll show you three uh, slides with equations, because I just love equations. And uh, if you've taken uh, the introduction to quantum field theory, this is, I think, fairly straightforward. So imagine you have a free quantum scalar field chi with mass m in Minkowski space. This would be the action for this uh, field. There's a kinetic term and a potential term. And the usual thing you learn uh, at the beginning of field theory courses is you mode expand the um, the, the scalar field into uh, uh, creation, and, uh, creation and, and annihilation operators and uh, with mode functions, chi of k. And the equation of motion of the, chi, uh, of the wave function satisfy the Klein-Gordon equation, the second derivative of chi plus the frequency squared times chi is equal to zero. It's the wave equation. And the frequency squared is the three momentum squared plus the mass squared. And then uh, if this is the differential equation, there are two solutions. You can choose pure outgoing positive frequency solutions. This would be a solution. You could also uh, choose another solution, negative frequency solutions. And uh, they, they are solutions to the Klein-Gordon equation. Now, things become interesting if you uh, do this, in the pr if you couple the scalar field to gravity. And here in red, I have, have all the gravitational part, just doing the standard thing, starting with the, gravity, uh, with the uh, scalar field in Minkowski space. Now we couple it to gravity. And it brings in a couple of technical things. The metric tensor is g mu nu, and this is the uh, uh, determinant of the metric tensor. There's a Ricci curvature scalar r, and there's a constant that one can put in uh, c, is a constant. 
Now, for a cosmological background, there's only one metric function that enters into the metric and the Ricci scalar. And uh, that's the scale factor of the universe, A of t. And it enters uh, in terms of the Hubble parameter, which is the time derivative of A divided by A, something that we know is the expansion rate of the universe. OK, so you have an action. You can find the equation of motion. Simple, straightforward exercise. And the parts in red are the extra parts because you've coupled the field to gravity. And it looks like a complicated equation, uh, but you can do a field redefinition and express this rather than uh, normal time in terms of conformal time, which is always used by cosmologists. I have a conformal time watch I'm wearing now. Cosmologists always use conformal time. And uh, it looks like a wave equation, except the frequency now, in addition to m and uh, the three momentum squared, involve these terms that involve how the scale factor changes with time. So effectively, you can think of these terms as a time-dependent mass that depends on the evolution in time of the scale factor. So you have a harmonic oscillator with the spring constant, the mass of the harmonic oscillator changing in time as the universe expands. The expansion of, uni of the universe changes the mass of the harmonic oscillator. And if the mass of the harmonic oscillator changes rapidly enough, the solutions will be non-adiabatic, and you can mix the different incoming and outgoing modes. And that's just what I'm saying here. The solutions to the wave equation are adulterated. Again, this is the wave equation. The frequency involves these terms, which depend upon the evolution of the universe. Uh, the prime is the derivative with respect to conformal time. So if the universe isn't expanding, this term vanishes. And this can be scaled to 1, and it just collapses to the usual wave equation. You can imagine a WKB approximation, some adiabatic approximation to the wave function with positive frequency solutions uh, in this form. And just plugging this into the uh, wave equation, you will see this will be a good solution if a couple of conditions are met. Um, the first derivative with conformal time of the scale factor and the second derivative in conformal time of, uh, excuse me, of the frequency have to be small. So abrupt changes in the scale factor leads to abrupt changes in the frequency, which adulterates the positive and negative frequency modes, leaving, leading to Schrodinger's alarming phenomenon, particle creation in the expanding universe. Final slide with equations, and I'll get back to more conceptual pictures of things. Uh, the solutions to the wave equations in general would include both positive and negative frequency terms. And if you start with only outgoing waves, this coefficient related to the number of particles in the vacuum, you would generate incoming waves where beta is not equal to zero. And the co-moving number density of the particles at late times is related to the absolute val value squared of this Boliubov coefficient. I told you this was my last slide of equations, but I lied to you. Uh, this is, I think, the expansion of the universe leads to a time dependence of the coupling of the fields to gravity. Uh, the expansion of the universe leads to creation of all species of particles so long as there is a time dependence to omega. And if you look at um, the frequency squared, this term, thank you, uh, this is negative. This term here can be negative. You can have tachyonic solutions. And the adulteration efficacy depends upon the abruptness of how the change in omega, which depends on how abruptly the scale factor changes with 
time, and many subtleties are growth, uh, glossed over. So this returns to this uh, picture of starting at, at er very early times with an adiabatic solution, so beta squared is zero, there's no particles in the vacuum, then the solution can become non-adiabatic, and eventually you end up with particles in the vacuum. And exactly how this evolves depends upon a little bit of the details of what you put in. Okay, why is this important? Well, it's Schrodinger's alarming phenomenon that that generates the primordial seeds of structure. As we look out in the universe, this box is meant to represent the large-scale structure, uh, the large-scale distribution of clusters of galaxies or galaxies, starting at early times with a um, almost, exact, almost exact homogeneous and isotropic distribution of matter if there are inhomogeneities, they will grow in time to become uh, the structure that we see in the universe today. So the way to think about this is to remember uh, that gravity is the ultimate free market force. The rich become rich at the expense of the poor. There's no regulation to it as the regions of the universe that are rich in density, accrete surrounding matter, and grow with time. So this is the idea of how structure in our universe forms today through gravitational instability. And we can get a view of what the initial conditions were by uh, looking from the cosmic, uh, cosmic background radiation which is a snapshot of the universe 380,000 years AB, after the bang. So for the first 380,000 years, photon, the universe was opaque, photons bounced around. Then 380,000 years after the bang, uh, the electrons combined with protons to form neutral hydrogen, and the universe became transparent. So as so looking out in space back in time to the last scattering surface of the microwave background radiation, we discover something curious, that there are correlations in the temperature and the density on scales that are much larger than 380,000 light years. How do you make correlations on scales larger than, the, than apparently the light travel distance? How do you make correlations more than 380,000 light years and less than 380,000 years? It seems to violate the speed limit of Einstein. But this speed limit is for the velocity of anything traveling through space, and there's no limit <clears throat> on the expansion velocity of space. And the seeming a-causal correlations require accelerated expansion of the universe. So let me show how that works with uh, two slides. This is a slide for the non-inflationary cosmology, the standard cosmology, showing two, uh, two, the evolution of two things. One is the Hubble radius, which is the maximum distance over which one can have correlations. And this is some co-moving wavelength, which grows as the universe expands. So um, today, we might observe some scale. Any scales we observe must be less than the Hubble radius. But if you look at 380,000 years after the bang, you can look on this length scale and this length scale is larger than the Hubble radius, but there are correlations on that length scale. Then the correlations come back within the Hubble radius after um, recombination. In the inflationary cosmology, it's assumed that there is an early phase of accelerated expansion when uh, the Hubble radius was roughly constant. Then you can have the scales being smaller than the Hubble radius, 
where and here you can impart correlations and then they evolve outside of the Hubble radius and eventually they will come back in the Hubble radius and they can be observed to have apparently a causal correlations. So in inflation, we visualize inflation by assuming that there is a scalar field known as the inflaton, which has potential energy and kinetic energy. The potential energy, the zero momentum mode of the inflaton field dominates. If this happens, then it leads to acceleration of the scale factor. And Schrodinger's alarming phenomenon produces inflaton particles because of the rapid expansion of the universe because Planck's constant is not equal to zero. The particles are produced with non-zero momentum and these fluctuations in the inflaton field are represented as fluctuations in the density and the temperature. It's the temperature fluctuations that we observe and the density fluctuations lead to the evolution of structure that we observe. So particles are produced when they cross the Hubble radius during inflation, during inflaton fluctuations on all scales, which are with approximately the same amplitude. That's something that follows by the field equations. And uh, this leads to something that's known as the harrison zeldovich spectrum of perturbations proposed by George Harrison and Jakob Zeldovich. Uh, this is an, and these are the predictions of inflation, a nearly exact harrison zeldovich power law spectrum. Of, you, know, you can read it. And uh, one has been experimentally determined. Two has been experimentally verified, as has three. And four, we have not yet measured the gr primordial gravitational waves, so we don't have proof of the consistency relation, but they're in the growing mode in a spatially flat universe. All of this comes from Schrodinger's alarming phenomenon. So remember when uh, you were in the sixth grade and Mrs. Sweeney told you about quantum fluctuations, but they're really tiny. You can't see them. They're too small to see. But the expansion of the universe have stretched the quantum fluctuations to be on scales as large as the observable universe. So if you're up here in College Station looking at the sky, uh, it's not College Station, not, uh, if looking at the sky, looking at the temperature fluctuations of the microwave background radiation, what you're seeing is a pattern of vacuum quantum fluctuations. Without the vacuum quantum fluctuations, without Schrodinger's original uh, uh, alarming phenomenon, uh, there would not be temperature fluctuations and there would not be density fluctuations, so there would not be anything in the universe to see, including the person sitting next to you, because you are all amplified quantum fluctuations. You all arise from Schrodinger's alarming phenomenon. So this leads to a, sort of an amusing situation uh, that quantum fluctuations, once microscopic, have been stretched due to the expansion of the universe to be as large as the observable universe. The map of cosmic micro background temperature fluctuations is a map of quantum fluctuations. It was produced 10 to the minus 35 seconds after the bang during primordial inflation. When the universe was dominated by vacuum energy and rapid expansion ripped the particles out of the vacuum, out of the quantum vacuum. And this is Schrodinger's alarming phenomenon, producing the primordial seeds of structure that grew to become all we see. And again, you are an amplified quantum fluctuation. And encoded in this pattern is, inferent, is the imprint of fundamental physics on very high energy scales. Again, there's something else that's predicted here. 
that the expanding, the expanding universe leads to particle creation, and the same thing should apply to gravitons during, during inflation. So here, the fluctuations in the inflaton field due to Schrodinger's alarming phenomenon during inflation as a length scale crosses the Hubble radius would appear to us later as temperature fluctuation, seeds of structure, and gravitational waves. So it's often said that you cannot look out in space back in time past the epoch when the universe becomes opaque, but the imprint in the microwave background fluctuations give us information about what happened during inflation, perhaps 10 to the minus 35 seconds after the bang. So the imperfections in this map, the fact that it's not smooth, those imperfections are beautiful. The wrinkles tell a story. Let me give you an example that you might be more familiar with. This is an image of Tethys, a uh, moon of Saturn. And um, this, if, we, if you go to a telescope and look at the moon of Saturn, you're looking at the moon as it existed 90 minutes ago, because it's 90 light minutes away. If you look at the microwave background radiation map, you're looking at the universe as it existed 380,000 years ago. But if you look at this moon of Saturn, you see that there are imperfections. The wrinkles here, the imperfections, tell a story. The craterings, the cratering that we see on the moon give us information about the formation of the moon, the early history of the universe. And the imperfections here, the wrinkles, give us information about the universe that existed at an earlier time. So let me wind down by saying, talking about another possible uh, application of this, and that is the realization that Schrodinger's alarming phenomenon applies to all particles. And then I have to put on my lawyer hat and say, so long as conformal symmetry is violated and may cause other bad things to happen to you or something like that. Uh, so all particles are produced during inflation. Could dark matter be produced during inflation? And this is something I've, many people have been working on. I've been working on with my collaborators. And this would be uh, the value of the dark matter density today by the observed density if it's created during inflation. And the, the details depend upon whether it's a scalar or a fermion or a vector and things like that. Here's two I've shown. And it's easy to get numbers about one, the value you want, for masses of particles divided by the expansion rate during inflation of about one. So here is the um, rationale of this. Inflation signals a new mass scale. The expansion rate of the universe at the time of inflation um, might, is comparable to the inflaton mass. Might expect other particles with mass comparable to the inflaton mass. Is one of them is stable. It's a natural candidate for dark matter. This would be a really massive wimp that uh, somebody named a wimpzilla. Is that a great name for it? Uh, and this leads to the disturbing possibility that dark matter might only interact with standard model particles gravitationally. Wouldn't that be disappointing? Okay, one of the things I like about this is that Schrodinger's alarming phenomenon connects the quantum and the cosmos. And there's a quote by John Muir that says, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it bound fast by a thousand invisible cords that cannot be broken to everything else in the universe. Maybe we cannot understand the largest structures we see in the universe or any astronomically sized structures without understanding their origin 
in the microphysics. And Schrodinger's alarming phenomenon is a way of thinking of it that connects creation of particles in electric fields, creation of particles in strong gravitational fields, and uh, creation of particles in the expanding universe. And this brings to mind a quote by Feynman, nature uses only the longest threads to weave her patterns. Each small piece of her fabric reveals the organization of the entire tapestry. Such a wind up and okay. Schrodinger's 1939 deep insight into particle creation in the expanding universe was correct in principle, although he made some technical missteps. Schrodinger wasn't very smart. It was not then and isn't much now appreciated. Was alarming to Schrodinger, but is now a fundamental part of cosmology. And it has profound implication for our understanding our present universe. We are all amplified quantum fluctuations. One day, perhaps, we're racing to discover the gravitons, the gravitational waves produced by inflation. Maybe dark matter was produced by inflation. I don't believe the end of this rich idea is there. The lessons to be learned lower the anchor of our peaceful studies into the ground of eternity. Don't be alarmed by what your equations tell you. They're often smarter than you are. Trust your equations. It's smarter than I am. And uh, beautiful physics has far-reaching implications. Thank you very much. Five o'clock, exactly on time. Yes. It wasn't wise. It was a stupid thing to do. But he did take asylum in the Vatican. Uh, Schrodinger, uh, you know, he was running from the Nazis. He was not Jewish. He was a member of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences and visited the Vatican as a member of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences. And, you know, there wasn't such a lockstep at that time in 1939 um, between Italy and Germany. Again, it doesn't make, well, where could he go? You know, he's on a train. And there wasn't many places he could go. He sh should have stayed at the University of Zurich uh, to begin with. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. No, no, no. Uh, but again, you know, it's, it's nature uses her longer, the longest threads to weave her tapestry, and it's related to so many other things. Okay, remember Chicago 68, UT nothing. <laughs> Thank you.